Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Clenda from UR Energy. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Tracy, and appreciate you having me back again. Jeff, did you have any idea that President Trump was going to issue that executive order last week? Uh, we did not. That kind of came out of left field. Don't get me wrong. We were very happy to see it. Uh, I wish that it would have been a little bit more specific in terms of what it was targeting. But as you know, with an executive order, it's it's laid out in very few pages. And, and the whole idea is that from the outset there, they are somewhat nonspecific. So while we would have liked to have seen more, uh, that's OK. We'll see how it plays out over the course of the weeks and months ahead. Well, I see that the media is just getting their teeth into it now. Uh, we particularly liked how uh, they were declaring the uh, supply chain, the need for critical materials supply chain in North America as a national emergency. That actually made us happy. Uh, can you comment? Do you believe it's a national emergency? Well, I think it's uh, not only is it a national emergency, I think it's been a national emergency for many, many years now. And what I found interesting was the language that they use because they talk specifically. And if you read the executive order, it really was targeted at China and it did primarily focus on uh, rare earths. But the fact is, is that what they described was the fact that the Chinese have been flooding worldwide markets with rare earths over the last several years and that this has destroyed the competitiveness of the domestic industry here for all of those materials. And this is something that, of course, we've been saying for three years now, starting with the filing of Section 232 in January of 2018. So I, I'm while uh, it you know, we didn't get uh, we didn't see a lot in the way of specifics. I'm glad that the message is resonating anyway. Well, we, of course, are putting together an international editorial board to provide updates on critical materials. We thought it was intriguing that they pointed out scandium and rare earth elements separately, since scandium is a rare earth element, and wanted to see if you want to add anything further for those people out there new to critical materials and may not appreciate the vital role that uranium plays. Well, I think that first of all, I think, let me start by just making a couple of comments with respect to the executive order itself. I mean, what it did is it directed the Department of Interior to explore means by which they could use the Defense Production Act to speed or facilitate the domestic, the, the, the development of domestic mines. That's all good. It also directs multiple agencies, the Interior, Defense, Commerce, Energy, and Treasury to report to the president within 30 days, to have written recommendations to him in 60 days, and then have follow-ups every 180 days after that. But it, importantly, if it asks and it directs these agencies to focus resources for the protection and the expansion of these materials. So this is all good. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, it was a little thin on detail. It only mentioned specifically um, gallium, barite, and um, pure graphite, high, high purity graphite. And so we didn't get a mention. And when I listened to the White House's um, conference call on this, they actually had some very good things to say. They, they mentioned all critical minerals. Um, when you at, talk about whether or not it's a national emergency, the reality is, is of those 35 critical minerals, we are reliant uh, for 31 of them on more, we are reliant uh, to the tune of more than 50% of our consumption on foreign entities and 14 of those critical minerals, 100% dependent. So yeah, it's, it is very much a critical issue. Um, they did not mention uranium specifically, either in the executive order or on the comments that came out of the White House. But uh, we do know that, uh, that assets are being directed. And one thing I would point out also is that uh, in, the, in the White House conference call, it specifically mentioned that the Department of Interior would be responsible for utilizing grants or providing grants, and that the Department of Energy would be responsible for providing uh, loan guarantees for uh, those in the industry in the critical minerals. So uh, that bodes well for us. It means that money's out there. It is being directed. We simply, it's up to us now to make sure we get a piece of it. 
Okay, so I'm so happy that we contacted you to get an update on this. Thank you, Jeff. So flipping to the Russian suspension agreement, you helped us understand that a little bit better in our most recent interview. Can you tell us what's happening with that now and how it's affecting the uranium market? Well, yeah, specifically, let's let's start out by uh, saying that it was finalized on Monday of this week. So it was it was uh, the extended and amended version of the Russian suspension agreement was finalized on Monday. Wilbur Ross came out and he had comments that he made on Bloomberg in a five minute interview. So I tuned into that on Tuesday dutifully. And uh, I think that it helps us in two ways. Uh, one, first of all, over a 20 year period of time, it reduces the amount of Russian material from 20% of our overall consumption to 17%. That's very much a positive. The other thing was with respect to the return feed. Now, in the past, what happens is, is that the Russians provide us with enriched uranium product. The utilities then send back the equivalent in return feed, whether that's U308 or UF6. Now, in the past, they could take that material, it could be enriched and derive a new origin because it was being enriched in Europe or elsewhere, and then it could be sold into the United States and it wouldn't be subject to the limitations of the RSA. Now that loophole has been closed. So now that return feed must be going through 10x on its way back and it must count against the cap. And that was one of the things that Wilbur Ross emphasized in his interview with Bloomberg on Tuesday. Okay, so I'm a... I'm interested in uranium. What are the benefits of the RSA then for a uranium investor? First of all, first and foremost, it caps the, the Russians. I mean, we this is something that we've needed to do. And below 20%, I'll be candid with you, we didn't get the percentage. We were engaged in the process since February of this year. We were pushing for a much lower percentage. The utilities were pushing for the percentage that actually ended up being the final percentage, which was an average a 17% over a 20 year period of time. So the utilities pretty much got what they wanted. They were not gonna be able to renew at 20%. So we'll take the, the reduction and that is gonna cap their material. Uh, unfortunately, those reductions don't really kick in until 2027. So uh, it puts us in a position where, yeah, we're gonna benefit overall from it and that feed component is critical. So it will mean that that material, once it's designated as coming from the Russians, it's not gonna come from elsewhere and they're not gonna be able to flood the, the market with material as they have been in the past. So I think that overall we have to look at it in terms of the larger benefit rather than, because there was nothing specifically for the Uranium producers in the RSA. Okay, so is there room for an appeal here? There is not. Uh, once it was finalized, it's done. And we knew that would be the case. And that's why we've been so actively engaged in the process since February. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we spend a lot of money on Washington, D.C. lawyers. Anybody who's ever done that knows that's no fun. And that's a that's a that's a burden on anybody's budget. But um, we we felt compelled to do that. We've been fighting this battle, whether it's been Section 232 Working Group or RSA now for three years. And so um, I think we got everything we could out of the RSA. Uh, I would have liked it if there would have been a specific component in there for the uranium producers. We just we just didn't get that. But we'll have to be we'll have to be satisfied with the overall advantages. And they are significant. So I don't want to undermine. I don't want to underplay those or downplay them. Well, speaking of things to discuss, we've had a lot on the news. Uh, there's been so much uncertainty happening presently between COVID-19, presidential elections. What should, you know, how is this going to impact your energy? How is this going to impact the uranium uh, market in general? I'd love to know what you think. Well, I think, first of all, uh, we were really headed in a positive direction when we saw that Kaz Adam Prom had shut down production and had halted well field development. That was very good for us. In addition to that, we saw that Cameco had uh, shut down Cigar Lake. Um, I didn't like it when, and we were seeming to get bids. We were, we were out, all of the equities were, were moving higher in price. Uh, it was deemed to be very good for us. They announced almost simultaneously that the Kazakhs were gonna begin well field development once again, and that Cameco was going to restart Cigar Lake. I have not gotten a status on either one of those, so whether or not they've actually fully restarted Cigar Lake, we don't know. 
and whether or not the Kazakhs have been able to get into the field. I don't know that either. We know that they've been able to get in there with their with their um, on staff labor, their contracted labor. I'm understanding they have had difficulty getting them back in the field and that they haven't been able to secure the number of drill rigs that they would like to deploy for the well field development. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. But as far as the presidential election is concerned, I think that this has great deal of importance to us. Look, there is no commodity on the face of the earth that's more highly politicized than uranium. And as that is the case, we know that we are have not been, for example, we were not the Obama administration's constituency, and we know that. And as a result, we saw a great deal more regulation put in place uh, that did not benefit us. It made our jobs tougher. We don't want to see a repeat of that. Uh, it, frankly, for us, and I'm speaking for myself here, not being political, but uh, just addressing it directly, the the uh, if there's no change in administration, that is going to be deemed to be very bullish for us. And so we know which side of this we come down on. Again, I'm being self-serving, but uh, we really, if there's no change in administration, I'll be very happy on November 5th. Well, just for the record, Jeff, we are having a lot of consistent messaging that echoes what you just said. So for everybody out there who currently owns UR Energy stock, can you just tell us what we should be anticipating this fall and winter? What are we looking forward to? Sure, there are a number of things, and I think that uh, a number of things that are going to happen, first of all, in the next three months. First and foremost, we just talked about it, the outcome of this election, that happens in less than four weeks now. So. Um, that's critical to us. That's very, very important. Also, as I mentioned, what has Adam Prom and what Cameco do and whether or not they're going to come in and now start weighing on the market again. Now, if you believe guys like Riaz Rizvi uh, with Kaz Adam Prom saying that the impact from their shutdown will be that will be seen in the fourth quarter and, per, and into the first quarter of next year uh, to the extent that it reduces the amount of material that they're pumping into the marketplace. Obviously, that's very good for us. But I think that now that the RSA is behind us, the general consensus is, is that we will see the utilities coming back into the marketplace. We're thinking that that's going to push prices higher before the end of the year. Obviously, that's not just good for us. It's good for everybody in the space. And we stand ready, of course, as you know, and as I've mentioned on this um, venue before, we have kept our operational staff in place. We're ready to ramp up at any time. We can do it faster at lower cost and with less dilution to our shareholders than anyone else. And we're chomping at the bit for the opportunity to do that. But I think that if we can if we can see those things happen, I think that uh, we're in very good position. And uh, we've been able, we, we're in strong, solid position in terms of uh, cash. And I, I hate to even uh, say this, but one of the things that we did is that we secured a very large database when we purchased our uh, Shirley Basin property from the French giant Arriva back in 2013. And we always said that what we'd like to do is we'd like to develop projects out of there. Well, what we've developed out of there is a gold project. We have been working on it so far in the early part of uh, October. It's in just a great neighborhood in Nevada. And we will actually have uh, drills on the ground there in the middle, uh, early part to the middle part of November. So uh, as much as I hate to say it in terms of adding value for shareholders, we actually are developing a gold project in the fourth quarter. So we hope that we see good things out of the uranium space. And frankly, you know, as many others in my space have commented on, Look, we got everything we wanted out of the working group and the working group report that came out on April 23rd. What we really need now is something like this executive order to light the fire under these agencies, specifically Department of Energy, to say, look, this is how we're going to fund this. Because right now we're at the mercy of Congress. Anybody, you don't want to be at the mercy of Congress. You just don't want this thing to be part of the budgeting process. But if we can now, I hope that this will signal resolve on the part of this administration. If there is no change in administration, it means that there will be follow through and they will provide the funds for the uh, for contracting for the domestic producers. And hey, if I had my choice between making a half a dozen deliveries a year to domestic utilities or making two deliveries a year to the federal government, I'll take the two deliveries a year to the federal government. And I know they're being business the from now, right? Well, Jeff, as always, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for an update for UR Energy to the Investor Intel audience. We appreciate it.
Tracy, thank you so much. And thanks for what you do for the industry. We really appreciate it.